Hey Rui, how are you? Good afternoon in your case. Good evening for us yeah. and good afternoon for you. Yes. How are you? I'm great. It's quite fresh here, 18 degrees, so really pleasant. Wow. I have my window. And Mumbai open. is 30 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Good to go to the beach, but nobody can now. <laughs> yes, we can only dream about the beach at this moment. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be talking about pearls today. And um, as most of you who are joining in here know that pearl is one of the oldest gemstones. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little about uh, Rui. His uh, full name is uh, Rui Galapim de Car Carvalho, if I, yes. if I pronounce it correct. Okay. okay. So... Uh, <laughs> So uh, he is the editor of uh, Portugal Gemas, which is a very popular um, uh, blog on uh, Instagram. You guys can check it out after this video. And Rui is an edu uh, a gem consultant. So over to you, Rui. Um, everybody would like to hear a little more about you. It's, it's easy. Thank you very much, PM. It's a, an honor and a pleasure to join you guys over there. It's easier to speak about pearls than to speak about myself. But I'm a gemologist, Absolutely. I'm an educator, I'm not a dealer. So I spend my days, as you see here, reading. So I read a lot of books, I read a lot of articles, have studied museum collections, uh, particularly in Portugal, have published many books and many articles, and do a lot of training, not only for gemologists, but also salespeople training. So that, that's what I do. Oh, and fantastic. And I love sharing knowledge because I, I'm so passionate about gemology and gems that I get excited when I learn something and I feel like sharing. So it's very good to be like here. Like we say, knowledge is power. Knowledge. Yeah. yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so getting uh, into the flow of what uh, the whole uh, session is going to be today, we're going to begin with um, talking about the different kinds of pearls and its origins. Then we talk about the various markets and uh, the treatments. Then we talk about the different kind of popular pearls. And uh, uh, also certificate and reports is one important topic that uh, often people are confused when it comes to pearls especially. Mm -hmm. And after that, we get into the Q&A where I see a lot of people signing in and they have personally written a lot of questions to me. So um, that's when we uh, begin the session with the audience Q&A. Okay. So choose my the first... easy questions, yeah. not the hard ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so to begin with, uh, um, what is a pearl and how is a pearl formed? Yeah, that's exciting because a pearl, uh, biologists, they call it a concretion. So it's something very hard that is formed mm. inside a mollusk, not necessarily an oyster. Actually, yeah. we call pearl oysters to an organism that the biologists, they called pterids, which is a totally different name, but we call them pearl yeah. oysters. Mm. Uh, and those mollusks, they can live in the sea and they can also live in ponds and rivers in land. So uh, freshwater mm -hmm. and saltwater environments. For the freshwater, we call it pearl mussels. For the salt water, we call it pearl oysters. But there are also other mollusks that are the, the snails, the sea snails. Some of yes. them, they can also produce those solid concretions. Then when they are beautiful enough, whether they have color, well, whether they have a porcelainless luster, or when they are nacreous with that iridescence mm. that we all relate yes. to pearls, then they become yes. a commercial product. And since prehistory, the oldest reported pearl so far is 8,500 8, years old. It was uh, wow. found in the Americas, yes. It's really, really old. So since uh, the dawn of time, when men was looking for food, they were harvesting food or fish bait, and they opened a mussel or an oyster or some, some mollusk, and they found a very beautiful thing. And then they started to collect, and that's how jewelry started collecting beautiful things from nature mostly yeah. those biogenic gem materials like pearls and then bones feathers and what have you so it all started maybe who knows with pearls absolutely it's it is so interesting and fascinating i mean we know things about pearls but we we actually don't land up knowing the origin or the history behind pearls yeah. and it's really nice that you told us about this so um talking about that uh are there various kinds of pearls? What are the types and where do they uh, origin from? 
Yes, a lot. Um, <laughs> when I started to study pearls more in depth, not when I was mm -hmm. a student, I did actually, to be honest, I didn't like pearls so much. But then when I started to read about them, to see them, to go to trade shows like the Hong Kong show or Basque yeah. show or other European shows or even Tucson, yeah. uh, I started to look at pearls and see the variety. And then I understood that the variety of pearl qualities, they all have to do with the animal that produces them. And so yeah. in the universe of the pearls, you have the natural pearl mollusks and they produce yeah. a lot of, I mean, a lot of species produce pearls. And also in the cultured pearl universe, you have specific animals that are used in pearl farms so they can produce a commercially viable pearl. So okay. in the natural pearl universe, it's a fascinating and very fat, vast world. And almost any mollusk with a hard shell, whether it is a snail or a bivalve, it can produce an, uh, a solid thing that we call a pearl. And sometimes they are beautiful and, and they, are, they are collectors of pearls for every species. So go figure that. Yeah. And of course, in cultured pearls, the, the amount of species that are used in pearl farms are much more limited. And so it also depends on the geography where they are, where the pearl farms are made. So the variety of pearls have to do with whether they are natural and within natural from seawater or from freshwater and whether they are yeah. cultured. Again, seawater or freshwater, oh, fresh but water. a limited number of species are used today. Wow, that is so fascinating. It is fascinating. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, moving further, tell me, um, like any other gemstones, does pearl also belong to a species? Like, for example, a ruby is from the Corundum family. Does pearl have their own species? Yeah, and that's another very important and very interesting question. Whenever people ask for a report today by a major gem lab like the GIA, mm -hmm. Danat, uh, SSCF, or Gublin, I don't know if Gublin issues pearl reports, but those major ones, when you issue yeah. a pearl for testing, they will try to figure out what is the species. Because the species, which is what you are trying to mention, they are very yes. important in knowing, for instance, where, where the, the, the pearl came from. Sometimes they can go into the species if they use a very modern technology, which is DNA fingerprinting. Danat in Bahrain, they do it. The SSCF yeah. in Switzerland, in Basel, they also do it. And so they can go and identify the species. But if you cannot, you, if you cannot take a little scrap of the pearl to make the test, you can go to a general group. What kind of, of genus? I don't know if you, if you remember when we were studying in high school, but the species yeah. have two Latin names, genus yes. and species. Maybe the species yeah. you cannot tell, but the genus you can. For instance, the pearls that are traditionally made in Japan, they, are, they yeah. come from a species called Pintata fucata or Pintata martensi. Yes. So maybe you cannot tell the species, but you know that it is a Pintata oyster or a Pintata mollusk. But Pintata also occurs in Tahiti, also occurs in Australia, Indonesia, Myanmar, what have you. So yes, it's so, uh, are there, the species. So is, are there any particular characteristics of these uh, to identify them that oh, yes. this is a species of that particular one? Oh yes, those guys, the, the real pearl experts, not myself, uh, when, they, when they look at the data, the chemical data yeah. and other spectroscopic uh, data in the laboratory, they have they compare it with a database that they, they keep, a very well-researched database, and then they can have an idea and issue an opinion. So and with natural pearls, it's even more challenging. It's, uh, that's why it's so fascinating to go into the, uh, into the species. Of course, you have indications like luster, size, um, color distribution, and many other, yeah. many other indications. Some are visual, some you need a yeah. microscope or fluorescence or other techniques mm -hmm. that are not that complicated, but often you need advanced gemological <laughs> equipment to be able to identify. And not that many labs in the world are yeah. capable of going into that kind of detail. So um, moving further, 
when cultured pearls came around what was the impact in the market i mean right now we've been talking about natural pearls but cultured pearls have changed the market in a big way oh yes uh, interestingly the cultured pearls started in the middle ages in china but not as a commercial product they used mussels from ponds and lakes and they they made little buddhas and they put the buddha mm -hmm. inside the mollusk so the mollusk would cover the buddha with nacre with matter of pearl so they became they are not actually pearls because they are not formed in a pearl sack but the idea of culturing something started in china a thousand years ago approximately the real culturing the real industry of culturing mm -hmm. uh, also had experiences in the 18th mm -hmm. century in sweden with carl von lin the one that is responsible by the binomial uh, mm -hmm. latin designation in biology Uh, he's a very famous scientist from Sweden, but he didn't succeed that much. The yeah. gentleman that did succeed, they started in the late 19th century in Japan. His name was Koki Shimikimoto. So everybody knows yeah. because of the brand that after the uh, his family yes. name. And he, in trial and error, and he joined scientists from uh, the university to figure out a way of culturing a pearl inside. An akoya oyster, and they call it locally akoya guy, which which means yeah. it's, it's a vernacular of that species, the fukata uh, the pintata fukata species in Japan, and he figured out how to produce on that very small shell small pearls, and they became commercially that they he got it in in the 1908. If I don't, if my memory doesn't fail me, he even patented the process. And internationally, oh. they started to come into Europe in after 1916, 18, after the First mm -hmm. World War, to be more precise. Yeah. And the impact, as you asked, was so great, particularly in Paris, because in Paris, Paris was the like the uh, world capital of pearls at the time. We must not. Rem uh, I, I'm going to go a little bit back. Um, mm -hmm. Mumbai in India, but before that. Surat, before that, yeah. Goa. They were Goa in the 16th century, Surat in the, uh, up until the 18th century, and Mumbai from the 19th century onwards were, were the Asian capitals of pearls. Actually, the world capital of pearls, because they had very close relationship with Bahrain and other Arabian countries. They were biggest producers, especially Bahrain. But in Paris, Paris was the European capital of pearls, and they they, they had their, their fair profits. When the Mikimoto product arrived mm -hmm. the market, they sued Mikimoto in in oh. court, saying that he could not sell those pearls. He could not tell that those little things were pearls. They lost. Oh. That's why we now mm -hmm. call them natural uh, cultural pearls to Mikimoto's okay. product. Not that many years later in Indonesia, some other guys they were already testing in bigger shells in the Pintata Massima and they managed to culture a pearl in Indonesia. Then decades later, uh, Australia and other countries like the French Polynesia, they came, they came into play. But all started with Mikimoto and uh, it, it's, a, it's really a fascinating story to Absolutely. read his biography because it's a, a biography of a, of a guy that didn't give up. He didn't give up. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, that, um, that's a brand most of the people know i mean when we think pearls um, that's those who are, that's one of the name that we think of as mikimoto of course he was the founding <laughs> father of culture of the cultural pearl industry yeah. so um having said that what are the major markets for natural pearls and cultured pearls they are quite different and that's another very good question cultural pearls are like massified you can see them everywhere mm -hmm. particularly the ones that are made in fresh water mostly in China. They are producing huge quantities. So you can see cultured pearls everywhere. You can also yeah. see the saltwater cultured pearls, uh, whether they are from the Akoya uh, mollusk, mostly made in Japan, but also the South Sea pearls from Australia, Indonesia, the Philippines, the Myanmar, and even the, the, the French Polynesia, which is a Tahitian cultured pearl, yeah. or the Solomon Islands pearls, or the Fiji cultured pearls. They all produce, and depending on the quality, they have different markets. And uh, of course, the Akoyas are more affordable than the Australian South Sea pearls, so they have different market 
uh, value, so they have different um, targets. The natural pearls, that's another thing, that's a niche. And uh, people mm -hmm. today, they don't understand natural pearls. They, they, yes. they know they exist, okay? They, maybe they see them in auctions. When they, when they go to antique shops, they see nice necklaces of, or earrings or whatever with natural pearls, but they don't even think that they are produced, and they are wrong. Today, there is a, not a significant, but a limited, but still commercially viable production of natural pearls in many parts mm -hmm. of the world, particularly in Bahrain. Bahrain has today, uh, has issued recently 3,000 licenses for pearl divers to dive and to collect yeah. pearls. And um, that enables the production mostly of the very small Bahraini pearls, which are which are traditionally they are very small, but occasionally big pearls came about. Mm -hmm. I know that you were in the, you were in Jewelry Arabia this year. Uh, last year. Uh, this year they had their yeah. at Danat booth uh, pearl yeah. diver. That was lucky. yes, I did I did see that. You yes. see that pearl, a thirteen millimeter yes. Bahraini uh, Gulf pearl. It's crazy size for yeah. for for that area. Usually the large natural pearls, they yes. came from Myanmar or even from Australia, from, from Asia, but not from that species, not from that area. So once in a while we get a lottery, you open an oyster, it's oh, 10 millimeters, yeah. it's crazy, it's crazy size. Yeah. And the pearl dealers and per natural pearl dealers, they are mostly, uh, they are mostly based in, uh, in the Persian Sea, uh, um, uh, Persian Gulf, area, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, but also in India. And they talk together. They are really close related to each other. They even use the same units to weigh pearl. This is the shav or shaw. I have no idea how to pronounce it properly. And uh, if you want to make a... Yeah, really that's the measurement unit, unit in India. Yeah. If you want to make a really nice necklace, natural pearl necklace, a graduated, because you have to do yeah. it graduated because the big ones they are really hard to find. Right, so absolutely. If you want to choose high quality, it can take you two, three, five, yes. years, 20 years to collect. Yes, That's why they absolutely. can be so, so very expensive. Agree, completely agree. And especially, a lot of people, uh, I believe, don't know that good quality pearls come from Bahrain, apart from the commercial ones that they look at. Yeah. And I mean, if, uh, uh, if, even if you are not an experienced diver, you can travel. I mean, not today. We cannot travel anywhere mm. these days. But when the lockdown is over, <laughs> yes. okay, yeah. go to Bahrain, and you can. Uh, there is a uh, there is a really exciting, fabulous thing that you can do there. You pay a fee. I have no idea how much it is, and you can dive yeah. to Pearl Bank okay. Zoo yourself. You really? Can dive and you can collect up to sixty oysters, and whatever you find, it's yours. How fascinating! Wow, Whatever so I need to take a trip to Bahrain definitely keepers. once yeah. once I'm allowed to travel. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good way of uh, making some tourism, great food, uh, lovely people, really hospitable people. I mean, you can die for pearls. And if you have a big family, Absolutely. and I know Indian families are quite large, you can take <laughs> all the family. If you have 10, you can have 600 oysters. So the, uh, oh. the probability and we, of making a pearl we, is enormous. <laughs> Just uh, on a lighter note, we may land up making another necklace, a Baroda necklace or a Maharaja Patiala necklace. Ah. <laughs> Do you know that? Do you remember the Patiala uh, rug? Not the rug. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Patiala are necklace. A round one and a square one. Yes. The majority yes. of them, they were natural pearls. But on those days, uh, and this must be said, the Gulf of Mana, which separates Sri Lanka from India, yeah. th they also produced pearls, but they, the production was erratic. Some years they produced much, some years they didn't. And the, the Portuguese back in the 16th century, when, when we also were in Goa, we had pearl yeah. divers in, uh, not we, we didn't dive for anything. We were just making the money. Eh? But um, <laughs> it's true, it's uh, history. Yeah. And, but in northern Sri Lanka, there are a lot of divers and they were already being baptized into Catholics. That's why you have a big Catholic community in the north of Sri Lanka. Yes. And they were Absolutely. pearl divers. Uh, because it, the, the, that region has also produced pearls. But we cannot forget Myanmar, Burma. Mm -hmm. In the old yeah. days, it was, it was called uh, uh, Pegu. 
uh, also produced fine quality and still today they can produce fine quality natural pearls in the bigger cycle. How interesting. That's so what are imitation pearls and how are they different from cultured or natural pearls? Oh, imitations are, have nothing to do with pearls. So in a very simple way, they are little spheres. Then they can be made of anything from plastic to glass to porcelain. Some of mm -hmm. those beads, on the old days, they even were hollow inside, okay? They were called Roman pearls. And in the outside, you need something to make them yeah. look as nacreous pearls. So yeah. the 18th century, this guy in France, he collected some fish. And uh, maybe, I don't know if you, if you bought already raw fish, you have to take the scales off. Yes. And when you look yes. at the floor, when they mix with water, they look iridescent, some of them. And some, some fish from the Seine River, uh, I don't know how to say in, uh, in English, in, I know in Latin, which is Alburnus lucidus, those scales, where he made the preparation and the, the, the stain or the dye, they looked like okay. necklaces, iridescent. So he used that dye to cover the spheres, and those were the most remarkable pearl limitations in antiquity. Of the antiquity, 300 years ago. Of course, today you can have artificial dyes looking the same. So an imitation pearl has nothing. It's a totally artificial product, and the composition depends on who manufactured them. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I completely agree on that. So, uh, having said that, our uh, when we uh, when we say um, uh, imitation pearls, do our natural pearls and cultured pearls treated in any way? Yes, to give them course. the luster or um, the color yeah, that they have. I, I can spend the next three hours speaking about <laughs> pearl treatments, okay? But let's concentrate <laughs> on cultured pearls and on the treatments on cultured pearls. One of the most famous treatments is dyeing. To stain, staining, I don't know how to say in English, dyeing, staining, maybe it's the different yes. word, but to, to change the color, okay? And okay. Uh, you have two ways of changing the color of pearls, particularly the freshwater cultured pearls. Um, yes. Some of them, they are really mm -hmm. dyed into blues, greens, pinks, the fancy yellows, what have you. But naturally, those freshwater cultured pearls, they come in mauve, orangey, pinkish, natural colors. But mm -hmm. you can remove the color to make them white if you bleach them. So you use a, a chemical, mm -hmm. a solution, to bleach okay. those pearls. What happens when you bleach pearls is the nacre is not as durable as if it wasn't treated. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm clear enough. So the durability of a treated culture pearl, particularly those freshwater, but I mean, we can also speak about the golden uh, culture pearls from, from the Philippines, for, in, for instance. Some have natural colors, but some have treated colors. And you can, you can, yeah. you can treat to be golden with heat and with other uh, mechanisms. And the color and or the luster won't last the same. So that's, in, that's why in, when you pass a certain level of price, you ask for disclosure of treatments, particularly the color authenticity. So to know if the color that you are seeing is the real thing or is like when we do makeup, we change. The <laughs> Some do makeup yeah. in orange as a and some do make up in other colors, so. <laughs> okay, that's, that's quite funny. Okay, so uh, tell me, but what are the different kind of pearls that are available? I mean, uh, popularly people just know about the South Sea or the Tahitian, but there would be a lot more categories available. Or on, it's easier to, to, to tell that with culture, because cultured pearls, you don't have that many species yeah. producing mm -hmm. commercially qu commercial quantities. Of, um, of cultured pearls. So I would say that the, for the freshwater cultured pearls, mostly two species. Uh, I can say the Latin. Yeah. The names, but that can be boring. Iriopsis slageli, Iriopsis kumingi, and also a hybrid that is made putting those guys together. So that's the mm -hmm. main group of species that is used in freshwater cultured pearl industry. When we go to the salt water, cultural pearl industry. You have the Akoya oyster, which is that yeah. one that it, it is produced in Japan, in Vietnam, and also in China and elsewhere, but the, mostly okay. it is in Japan. And then you have the Pintata Massima, that is the yeah. 
main one in Australia, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Myanmar, and then you have the Pintata margaritifera, and then you have variations okay. of that one. Some live in Polynesia, French Polynesia. We call them Tahitian cultured pearls. Tahitian. Some live yeah. in, the, in the Solomon Islands. And a very specific one uh, is lives in the Fiji Islands. And uh, in that one, the, the production is very small, but the colors are very, they are earth, earth colors, really nice natural colors. And, um, and so, we have also in Mexico a very small production using not Pintata species, but other kinds of, of oysters. So, but basically, commercially available, those are the main, the main ones. So uh, what about Keshi pearls and Mabe pearls or the Basra ah. pearls? Where would these come from? The word Keshi. The word Keshi <laughs> is quite simple. Do you speak Japanese? No. <laughs> I wish to learn though. But Keshi in Japanese stands for small. Okay? Before, yes. Even before cultural pearls were even dreamed of, the Japanese called the very small seed pearls, seed meaning very small, yes. they called them keshi. When uh, Mikimoto started doing his cultured pearls, by accident, mm -hmm. some little pearls were formed as a byproduct of the culturing process. And because they were small, they were called keshi. Eventually, okay. the word keshi originally used for natural pearls was corrupted, the sort of saying, into the cultural pearl universe, meaning, and today, Keshi means, not the original meaning, but today, what it means is a, a pearl that was made by accident or intentionally as a byproduct mm -hmm. of a culturing process. And that particular pearl has no bead mm -hmm. inside. So it's a no bead or beadless uh, cultural pearl. Mabe on the other side. Mabe is the name, the Japanese vernacular of a species, Mabe Gai. And it yes. was used pretty much in the sense the Buddhas yes. were made in China a thousand years ago. You, you, you had that Pteria oyster, you put a cabochon, let's call it a cabochon of some material, the, the oyster would cover it with nacre, yes. and so it would yes. make like a bubble. That's why, okay. why we call a blister. But because that blister was not made inside the pearl sac. This is already too complicated, but the, we cannot call them pearls. So it's a blister, a cultural blister. That's the correct name. But the, the word Mabe has been taken as a synonymous of a cabochon-like product, necklace. But correctly, we shouldn't call it a pearl. It's a, it's a cultural blister. Of course, we have also natural blisters, we have also natural blister pearls, mm -hmm. cultural blister pearls. It's, it's a mess. Not a mess, but it's yeah. a mess. Yes. So, uh, uh, is, um, and how do mother of pearl, I mean, a lot of people confuse mother of pearl as shells also. Is there, uh, is there any sort of similarity or yes, they're all together different? It's the same because mother of pearl is shell. The difference is it's a, it's a certain kind of shell that has certain visual characteristics. The, okay. And the visual characteristics are the ones that we associate with mother of pearls that have been traditionally used for buttons, for, yeah. for inlays in marquetry and furniture, for jewelry, but also recently for the cultural pearl industry because the bead that you put inside the animal to make a, yeah. a bead cultured pearl is made of mother of pearl. So uh, what, and what makes all of these pearls expensive and timeless? Um, in pearls, size matters. <laughs> so the bigger, the better. Maybe not the same okay. in real life, but in pearls, the bigger, the better. <laughs> so uh, no, no, seriously, yeah. we, the pearls have uh, five virtues. Like we, we have the four C's for diamonds, right? So in yes, pearls, yes. you have five virtues. And if you want, you can add another one. The first virtue, let's call them the size. So the bigger, the better. And then the, okay. you have the luster. Luster is the way that light is reflected from the surface. Then you have mm -hmm. the surface itself. Is it clean of pits and blemishes, natural blemishes, I say? Or is it like full of, uh, of PK, like we say in diamonds? Yeah. Then we have mm -hmm. color. Is it silver yeah. gray? Is it white? Is it pink? Is, is it golden? And you have 
so many colors and overtones. And then you have shape. Is it round? Is it near round? Is it baroque? Is it uh, uh, semi-baroque, which is a pier, which is uh, the mo yes. most rare ones in nature are the pier shape. That's why, by yeah. the way, pearl means, in Latin, li means little pier, pirulum. So it's another uh, nice thing. Um, and, uh, and by the end of the one, session, right? we learn... Sorry? Sorry. By the end, end of the session, I'll learn a few Latin and Japanese words. There All of go. us will. <laughs> there you go. So I yeah. thought about the five yeah. virtues and there is another one. Okay. Yeah. And I just mentioned briefly a couple of minutes ago, uh, subliminary, which is consistency. When you, mm -hmm. when you are in the top quality pearls, whether it is cultured or natural, if you want to gather a pair, top quality, necklace or a bracelet or even a set, yeah. you, mm -hmm. need cons you need to gather pearls of a certain size and all those five virtues like this to find Absolutely. one is hard. To find two, yes. two is harder. To find a set is crazy. That's why Absolutely, so, yeah. That's why in very high quality, you, I mean, the, the pearl farmers or the pearl dealers, they, they whether they are cultured or, or natural, they, they spend a lot of years waiting, waiting until they make the collection. Perfect. But I, it's so interesting. I mean, a lot of consumers often wonder why are pearls so expensive, but they do not understand the story and the history yeah. behind it. Moving further, is there any sort of a, a grading process for pearls, just how we have for diamonds? Mm. Uh, pearls, depending on the laboratory, GIA has one grading system. Uh, the Danat in Bahrain has another grading system for natural pearls. But they are, there is no system, no benchmark, mm. if, you, if, if, if we can say like this, like we have the GIA yeah. International Diamond Grading System that's benchmarked all over the world for diamond grading and, and diamond nomenclature. In pearls, we don't, we do not have that. Uh, but we do have, mm -hmm. we do know what has to be mentioned or what can be uh, checked on a pearl to communicate its value. First is the species. If it is mm -hmm. a South Sea, Taishian, Nakoya, yeah, and in a natural pearl, if it is Bahraini, if it is Southern American or whatever. And then the uh, five virtues. And GIA talks about it. Uh, Danat also has the, the same kind of uh, setting, SSCF as well. But there is no grading system in place. So we can look at the pearl, look at some codes, alphanumeric codes, and understand value. No, that doesn't exist yet. I have no idea if it will be implemented or not. But... Uh, uh, the diamond is easy. Colorless yeah. diamonds, I mean, are easy. It's one stone, and the four the four basic criteria they are easy to 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 see and to understand. To work around pearls, that, yeah. only in species you have a lot, and you have not yes. four but five criteria. So <laughs> multiply the five criteria by the different pearl variety, and it's a uh, as they say in Italy, casino. So, uh, talking about, since we're talking about grading, uh, often we use the word certificate and a report. Mm. So, what works for pearls and are they mm. the same in any manner? Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been on the industry for many, many years and uh, I have always heard and used the word certificate. Oh, is that mm. a cert? Do you have a cert? That's like a, a, a colloquial term that we use consistently, but... If we care to check the names of those documents that are issued by the major reputable jam labs all around the world, you don't see the word certificate in any of them. You see the word report because, and that there's, there's a reason for it, and also Sibja, which is the World Jewelry Confederation, has made the recommendation a couple of years ago saying to avoid the use certificate because in certain languages, certainly in English, the word certificate may have a legal meaning. And most yeah. reports, the only things that are really accurate, and then w whatever laboratory you submit a stone to, they will be the mm -hmm. same, is the nature of the material, the size in millimeters, and the way in carats. All the other things, color descriptors, grading criteria, etc., they will differ. So using a report, using the word report yeah. is more in line with, with, with what it is actually that document that is a, an expert opinion 
issued by a reputable laboratory. I don't know if I answered your question. No, absolutely, you did. So in a layman's language, um, what are the techniques to identify a good quality pearl or any typical characteristics for um, uh, a good quality pearl? If you are experienced, use your own eyes and your look. And you look for those five things. But, but okay. the difficult thing is, if you haven't seen that many pearls before, you don't know what are you comparing with. So um, if you have experience in pearls and you have seen many, <laughs> when, you, when you see the pearl with your own eyes, you can immediately see the luster. You can immediately see the color and then yeah. immediately see the, um, the shape. And then you can immediately on your scale see the carat weight and you can have your hand lens and inspect the surface quality. And only like that, you're done. And if you are experienced, you know if you are here or if you are below. But it takes a lot of years mm -hmm. to get experience. But from a consumer's perspective, I mean, most of them would not have uh, a lens. For them, is the same, uh, same five measures applicable or yeah. there's something else of that course. they would consider also? They can look for those things and uh, they can <laughs> ask the retailer to show him uh, different sets of jewelry with uh, or necklaces with different quality. And that's easy mm -hmm. with a Koya culture pearl because you might have uh, in the seven millimeter range, you can have different qualities. So you can put them yes. side by side and then you can yeah. check the shape, you can check the luster and you can check the surface quality, you can check the color and then you look at the price tag and maybe you will understand. For instance, in a Koya, above eight millimeter, the price mm -hmm. goes up. Absolutely, yes. And, uh, but when you look at the eight, millime eight and a half millimeter pearl, maybe by memory you don't separate from a seven, seven millimeter or 7.5. But we know that we have two necklaces together. One is 8.5, another is 7. And this one can be the same <laughs> quality, but this one it will be a lot more expensive. So Just no, like a diamond, kind of thing, for a 95 no. pointer or a one carat, yeah, well, it's, the same. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's uh, it's a similar manner the way we do the grading. So um, going back into history, the royal family, especially in India, wore a lot of pearls. And uh, given today, even we see um, Queen Elizabeth wearing pearls a lot of times. Is there any reason that pearls are so special? Yeah. Uh, there is a. Um, uh... I mean, you, you, you must know the history of Shiva and the, um, and the, and the ring and the, the wedding ring. So in the old days, pearls, because of the color and the nacre, they standed for purity. Even mm -hmm. in, the, in the Quran, uh, there aren't that many gemstones mentioned in the Quran, but pearl is one of them. And pearl is associated with paradise. So in many cultures, from Hindu culture, even from a Catholic or a Christian culture, Muslim culture, pearl is synonymous of a very delicate, candid, purity. Mm -hmm. I remember, yeah. I don't remember when my parents got married, but my, my mother's wedding ring has a diamond and a pearl. Mm -hmm. Because pearl oh, was, uh, was a, a symbol of virginity, of purity. Of course, yes. today girls, they don't care. But in the old days, it's in, here in Europe, it's like this. But in the old days... I also read somewhere that uh, it's, it's considered uh, auspicious as uh, for fidelity. Yeah, it, maybe it works. Maybe it works, yes. Probably, uh, yes. Sorry, idea. you were saying something. Uh, no, no, no. At the, on, on the lore, on the beliefs, I, uh, Pearl actually, since Cleopatra, uh, is a symbol of love. Is a symbol of, uh, I mean, my, my, my mother's wedding ring has a pearl, right? So it had that meaning. Then in 1946, when the, after the, the Second World War, when the beers invested heavily in marketing for diamonds, then mm -hmm. the consumer started hearing diamonds, diamonds, diamonds. Okay, now a wedding ring is diamonds. But that's a result of decades of marketing. Very smart marketing. They are really good at doing that. But pearls, they lost it. Okay, and uh, but still today I, I have a, one friend that the husband mm -hmm. gave gave her a ring with a nice Tausi pearl 
because it was standing for purity, all those values. So oh, the world can also have that kind of uh, significance and goes back in history, go, goes back to Veda's text. So go there and research and everything is there. Wow. So um, personally, tell me, which is your favorite pearl? Have, ah. we've, you must have seen so many, read about so many of them. Let me tell you that about favorite pearls or gems by all that matter. I am a polygamist. I like men. <laughs> So it's different to stick with one. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to add that further. <laughs> so, uh, off, uh, okay, I've asked about the felpers. Now, um, let's move into the questions what people have asked. Um, I had uh, Anahita one, write to me, uh, what is the difference between Chinese and cultured pearls? So I think mm. we've pretty much answered that, but yes. Mm. Mm. Uh, we'd like to uh, hear from you. Colloquially, we refer to freshwater cultured pearls that are notably produced in China as Chinese pearls. But the, the expression Chinese pearls doesn't mean nothing. It only means that it's a product made in China and it can be a freshwater, it can be a salt water, it can be anything. So the most correct way of addressing those products is freshwater cultured pearl. And if it was made in China, it was a a Chinese fresh water popsicle. Um, T. Singh, Pallavi and Riddhika, all, uh, I, and a lot of people here are asking, how do you identify natural pearls and, um, and uh, pearls that are not natural? Okay. Imitation you, or culture. Uh, imitations from the other pearls, easy. Very easy. Mm -hmm. you, with a little experience, Absolutely. a look, you do it. But to separate the culture from a natural pearl, if you have a bead, certain gemological techniques on the laboratory, I underscore on the laboratory, you can tell. But if the pearl doesn't have a bead, so if it is a beadlet yeah. with no bead, yeah. then you require not only advanced equipment, but also experienced pearl identification people. That's why not that many laboratories offer that kind of service for very complicated pearls. When you have a bead inside, an X-ray will, will solve your problem. But if you don't have a bead, if it is a cashy cultured pearl, uh, that's the commercial name of those products, then for um, equipment and a lot of knowledge. Okay. What is the technique to identify Basra pearls? Basra pearl is, um, is a trade name. Ba Basra is in, in, in Iraq, okay? It used to be a trading center for Gulf pearls back in the day. Basra doesn't produce pearls. It was only a yeah. trading center. And uh, Basra pearls, basically it means uh, natural pearls produced in the Arabian or Persian Gulf. So uh, you identify a Basra or a natural Gulf pearl in the same way. Any uh, labs that you would recommend um, in any India friends? or internationally? Well, any laboratories that you would recommend uh, in India or internationally to grade pearls? I, I, I just mentioned a couple of them. GIA, the, yes. the pearl department is in Bangkok. It's led by a yes. great pearl expert, Nicholas Truman. He's really capable, really knowledgeable. You have also mm -hmm. Danat in Bahrain. Yeah. And the chief gemologist is uh, Stefano Scarempelas. He's like a uh, monster in terms of knowledge and science. And you have Pearl uh, also at the SSCF in, uh, in Basel, Switzerland. I think it's Laurent yeah. Cartier that he's the head of the Pearl area or um, Michael um, Kremnici. Uh, so those three labs, and I'm sorry if I'm missing a major lab, but those are the ones that have been issuing um, uh, art peer review articles on scientific papers based on whatever research they are doing or their labs. So they are the three major ones. Of course, you have more pearl experts, but to solve that very complicated issues of the cashy, non-bead cultured pearls, you need a lot of expertise and you need advanced equipment. And sometimes only uh, laboratories with that kind of expensive materials can deliver. So here we have IIG asking, after Chinese pearl came into the market in abundance, that also made a pearl value and preference lesser and lesser. Mm. 
I mean, those pearls, yes, the freshwater cultured pearls that have started to be produced in China many decades ago, they, they came to the market in a very cheap price, particularly those rice crispy ones, the, the, the very original ones. Now they have different prices because you have different categories. But the other, the saltwater cultured pearls, they, they, they had fluctuations, but they had nothing to do with, with that kind of uh, product. Of course, the, the, the freshwater cultured pearls made in China, they became available in a very affordable prices to almost everybody. So in, uh, probably some consumers, instead of spending a few thousand dollars in some saltwater cultured pearls, they were spending a mm -hmm. few dollars or a few tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars in a freshwater uh, set of jewelry. So that maybe made a difference. But uh, if you look at the prices today, it's, uh, the, the salt water, they are still very expensive. Yeah. I'm, running um, out of, I'm running out of battery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to... to uh, you to have to see. connect a charger. Is that okay now? Hopefully it works. Okay. Yeah, I um, so we have someone asking, is there a difference in price uh, if the pearl is drilled or it's not drilled? I don't think so. Pearls are drilled uh, for stringing necklaces. But the, I, I wouldn't know how to, how to answer that question. But normally pearls are not sold drilled. They are sold undrilled. Mm -hmm. Or if they are drilled, they are already on a strand. But I don't know how to how to respond honestly. Okay, Sumit is asking your do pearl prices are also regulated just like diamonds? Uh -huh. Natural pearl prices, it's a nice mystery, because you don't have that many natural pearl dealers in the world. You have them in the Bahrain, in the uh, United Arab Emirates. You have them in Qatar, in Oman, and you have them in Mumbai. And they know each other. It's a very small club. So they kind of uh, converse the prices together and they set the prices together. On the cultured pearl side, it's totally different because you have different producers, different pearl farms, different areas. So they put the product on the market depending on the offer and demand. But the most fascinating market is the pearl, the natural pearl, because we have no idea how they do it. How do, how do yeah. they decide? But they decide in between them. Because the, the Arabs, they sold mostly to the Indians. And they, because they are experienced, they look at it and say, oh, this is 1,000. No, this is 1,200. No, this is 2,000. So they know. It's very hard to go in, really hard to go in and to understand mm -hmm. how prices are made. But it's fascinating. His next question is, uh, do we have natural colored pearls? Yes, of course. Absolutely. And... Uh, when the Columbus arrived in the Americas in the 16th century, uh, one of the most important things the, the Spaniards got from there were the black pearls. That's why when we see mm -hmm. movies on pirates, we see the black pearl, right? And even in yeah. the Pirates of the Caribbean, the motion picture, the boats, the vessel, it's called the black pearl. And we have a, the black pearl is like a mythical thing and all started in the Americas. Because when they got there, some of those species that live in there, they produce uh, natural dark pearls. And the colors are actually natural. And of course, in any part of the world, the different muscles they produce, they may produce different colors and natural colors in nature. In the cultured pearl industry, of course, in Tahiti, you also have natural colors, but in cultured pearls. I don't know if I was clear enough. I... I... For me, that was good. I'm sure um, it was good enough for them also. So we have um, Gitanjali asking, are there any categories in Baroque pearls? Categories? Uh, I mean, yeah. Bar in, oh, in Baroques, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Baroque is like totally <laughs> Okay? Yeah. But some mm -hmm. Baroques, they are quite... Oh, sorry, let me put this this way. Sorry about this. Uh, I'm charged okay. with the phone. And um, some Baroques are quite interesting because you can... Uh, you can use it as a shape of a body of something. And when we go back 500 years to see um, jewelry from the 1600s, we see large or small pearls with odd shapes, with the Baroque shapes yes. being used to make, uh, to, to be part of, of, of a jewelry yeah. sculpture. 
And that was kept for, even today, we, we see that. But if there are different types of Baroques, I have never heard of it, because Baroque is, is what it is. Uh, but the, if, you, if you have an axis of symmetry, that's called mm -hmm. semi-Baroque. And then you have the button shapes, you have the ovals, you have the piers, but not in Baroques to my knowledge. Okay. Which colored pearls are more in trend now? Uh, you, I'm not a market analyst. I would hardly <laughs> know how to reply to that one. I'm a very boring intellectual educator, not a market analyst. Sorry, I don't know how to reply. Um, uh, Anurag is asking, uh, what pearls would be a great investment? The ones that you like. Because <laughs> pearls, guess, pearls are yeah. made to fill the hearts and to provoke sensations and emotions. So one should buy whatever makes us feel good. That's the best invest investment we can do. In terms of financial investment, uh, I'm a very boring educator, so I wouldn't know how to reply. But buy what, what your heart tells you to buy. That's mm -hmm. the right investment. Because investing yeah. in us is better. Money is going to our children and grandchildren, and they will spend it. So spend the money in yourself. Nisarg is writing, Hi, Rui and Prema. I am an avid diver and recently started studying about the Japanese pearl divers. Okay. I am amazed I'm at the history and... Uh, I'm amazed at the history and... Uh, Lian, uh, all of them are women and have a family legacy. Just amazing. Thank you, Nisarg. Oh. Uh, uh, pearl as an investment, we've already answered that. What type of pearls can get famous in the future? That's again a marketing related question. Famous. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the big ones, I don't know. Um, I have no idea. Natural pearls, I think they are restarting to be looked after and look, not look, looked after, looked for. There was a couple of years ago a large pearl that belonged to Marie Antoinette. She was Queen of France. She was Austrian, she was Queen of France, mm -hmm. and she was beheaded during the French Revolution, right? And she had this pearl and a necklace. And the pearl and necklace and other jewelry from Marie Antoinette, they were on sale, I think on Christie's, I don't want to make a mistake, I think it was Christie's, on a major auction house. And I remember almost nine years ago, the La Peregrina, which was a very old pearl that also belonged to Elizabeth Taylor, the famous Hollywood, Hollywood actress, it sold for $11 million. And this one pearl that belonged to Marie Antoinette went to auction with a, with a starting price of one to two million dollars. Do you know for how much it sold? No idea. 36 million dollars. Okay. It's like, I mean, it's, it's a boat. You buy a boat and you spend everything. So it's not much. Or you buy an airplane. So that's, uh, of course, this price has to do with provenance. It belonged to a very famous queen. And I know that the lady that bought that pearl, she's Austrian. So there was a provenance in effects prices of jewelry. But because of the Peregrina, because of the uh, Marie Antoinette pearl, you saw on social media during the auctions and after a lot yes. of postings on natural pearls. And the, the public became aware of the value of certain natural pearls. Of course, we are talking antique natural pearls, but we also have modern natural pearls. So I think, and with, with this kind of um, situations in auction houses, with those prices, people become aware. And through hmm. our Cousin, also. Sorry, sorry, uh, complete what you were saying. Hmm. Also through education, what we are doing now. Absolutely. Uh, Karana is asking, can you tell about conch pearls and are they also cultured or they are natural? Hmm. There was a um, conch pearl. It's made on a, on a gastropod. The best ones mm -hmm. are pink. There is a, a very nice documentary. Go, I think it's on Vimeo or YouTube. Search uh, documentary conch pearl. I think it's in mm -hmm. French. It's a fabulous documentary. And... Um, uh, conch pearls, they come from that gastropod, that is Lobatus gigas, they formerly was n known by another name, Strombus gigas, 
but it's harvested for food, the gastropod, and it's endangered today, and it's listed on Appendix 2 of CITES. But every now and then, a pearl is collected by the fishermen. They don't look for pearls, they are buying the meat. But occasionally, they find it, and they can be really expensive, really, really expensive, particularly the large ones with good yeah. color and with a good, a good flame structure. Uh, and you asked also culture. Yes, there were attempts on culturing pearls, but culturing pearls on a gastropod is challenging. So in, in the United States, they did a few experiments. They produced a few, but I don't think they are commercially available. And if they were ever commercially available, it was a research project that then, that, because there are issues on culturing those kinds of pearls in gastropods. I don't, go, I don't, don't want to go into the biology of it, but uh, there is a, it's challenging. Science, I'm sure, maybe will solve the problem in the future. Um, Akarshan James is asking how to get Basra pearl certified in India. How to? Uh, I, I have no idea. Sorry, in India, I have no idea. Uh, you, I don't know if you know Jai Shri Panchikar. Mm -hmm. the, um, maybe she can recommend where. She's a very respected Indian Jamaica. She's world renowned and she would know where, where should you submit a pearl for testing. But if it is a very complicated situation, maybe those three that I've mentioned are, are the, the good ones. So uh, last thing, Rui, tell us a tip about how to take care of pearls. How to take? How do you take care of pearls? Ah, pearls have uh, little bits of water inside and it, they are very fragile, okay? So never put them at the, in the sun, in the sunlight. Don't put them in very dry environments. If you have mm -hmm. a safe and you want to keep yeah. your pearls on the safe, make sure the safe is not very dry. You can have like a cup of water and put it next to the, in, inside the safe with the pearls. Also, don't use cotton to wrap your pearls. Cotton can absorb, over time, can absorb the water and it will degrade the, the, the pearl. Also, when you, we use the pearls next to our skin, we should clean them with, an, with a damp cloth, with no detergents, with no chemicals after each, uh, after each uh, use. And also, when you take off your jewelry, when you go to bed, don't put them together with other jewelry items because pearls have a very low hardness, so they can be yeah. scratched. And you don't want a pearl with blemishes, right? So make sure you wear them with care, particularly in rings. In a necklace, clean them as much as you can. And if you put perfumes, don't put perfumes over the pearls. Over. Yeah. And so some people have more acid uh, transpiration than others because of yeah. food habits or what have you. So if, if we know that we have acid um, sweat, try not to wear the pearls over the skin because acids will attack the material that composes the pearl. So basically the major, most important, oh, and don't, don't bang them. But that's, <laughs> that, that's obvious, yes. I think. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. This was uh, Rui's first Instagram live. And yes. he has been absolutely amazing. Like nobody can even say that it was his first attempt on an Instagram live. But right. I'm really happy that uh, you accepted. It yes, was a pleasure. Uh, it was, thank you very much, PM. It was really a pleasure. Anytime. Be safe. Absolutely. Stay Thank you and same to you and everybody out there, my positive vibes to everyone over there. Thank you everyone for signing in.